All right, let's come back and find our seats. Yeah, let's make our way back to our seats. Really, uh, really excited, anticipating just a great time in the Word today. Amen. Do you guys have that slide that I just sent you from uh, just a second ago? They're downloading it. I just want to let you know what's happening as we uh, move forward today is uh, we're very blessed today on Mother's Day to have Danica with us. I'll introduce her in just one moment. Uh, but I want to let you know as you uh, just prepare in the following weeks that next week we are uh, starting a brand new series on the book of Philippians. And I want to encourage you to just uh, be reading the book, get in the book, actually even by next week, uh, spend some time in Acts chapter 16. Acts 16 is the launch of the Philippian church, and uh, that's, where, that's where it gets planned. It's a really spectacular story. So uh, you can read Acts 16, and uh, then we'll be moving into Philippians uh, in the following week. Bro, guys, B Benny, don't worry about it. It's all right. It's all right. It's all good. So, uh, yeah, we're very blessed today uh, as, we, uh, as we celebrate Mother's Day to have a mom with us um, that's going to share out of the word. I want to just uh, share a little bit about uh, Danica uh, to all of us just as I present her to you uh, to, as she shares today. Uh, Danica, as many of you already know her, she's the oldest of uh, a family of nine children of Rick and Darlene uh, Sinclair, uh, raised here and certainly carries the vision of the house, carries the vision of, of the house. By, by 14 years old, Danica was leading worship regularly. Is that, is that accurate, Danica? By 14? And uh, uh, it's uh, just... William beat you to it, you know, by 13, you know what I'm saying? He's, you can take that down. That's for next week, guys. You can take that down. Um, uh, uh, leading worship regularly. And by 18, uh, you were uh, leading uh, the worship team here at CFC and certainly helped uh, us through the years cultivate a passion for worship and is even, even doing that today and just uh, so appreciative uh, your heart there. Uh, spent significant time through your years on the mission field. If I remember right, when I, when I was first getting to know you myself, your heart was to be a missionary and uh, to go to the far reaches of the world and uh, share the gospel of Christ. Spent time in India, China, uh, Turkey, Spain, any place else you've been? Uh, serve no other. <laughs> Louisiana, yeah, that, 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 that works. Um, and, uh, you know, now a mother of seven herself, a wife of, uh, of course, Ryan, and uh, one of the elders in the church, uh, a daughter of the house, uh, but now a mother in the house as well. And for one more thing, I just want to honor you in. You know, I spend the majority of my time with your two teenage sons. They are amazing young men. They really are. And I'm just uh, so, you know, we all get excited. You know what I mean? Like, are we picking up, really, you're picking up William and Jameson tonight? Um, because they, they make such a difference with us and in our lives in the Levandusky world as we travel to Ogdensburg and youth and everywhere that they travel with me. And, and, um, but that's, uh, that, that's an honor to both you and Ryan in doing a great job uh, with these great young men. So let's give it up for Danica Dunphy today. Um, I, I'll, I'll pull it up a little bit. <laughs> Let me find my, find my spot here. Good morning. This is so exciting for me. Um, I love, I love the Lord. Psalm 25 says, um, show me your ways, O Lord, lead me in your path and teach me for you are the God of my salvation on you. I wait all the day. And, um, when we pray that he does it. And I think that's amazing that like the God of the universe shows us his ways. This isn't that simple, is it? There we go. That's good. Um, God has put stuff in my heart through the sewing of other women, my mom. He's put stuff in my heart as I've walked with him and sought his ways and his word. And um, 
I love getting able to share that with people. Maybe there will be nothing new here today, but at the very least, you can sit and say, oh, her God is my God, and he's saying the same thing to us. And I don't know, I love that. I love when I'm talking to one of you and hearing what the Lord's doing in your life and me, my heart just like pounding, like, yes. Yes, that's the same God who talks to me. That's amazing. I just think that's so cool. So um, today we're, we're going to um, focus in Nehemiah. There's a verse that was, has, is just, oh, it just pounds in my heart all the time. Um, the, the Lord has just used it so many times to encourage me. It's um, Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 3. We're going to look all over Nehemiah, but we're going to start there. Nehemiah 6, 3 says, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? Um, Nehemiah, and we'll get into a little background here for a minute, but Nehemiah was called to a great work in the, in the context of immense opposition. And that is what motherhood is today. It is a great work in the face of immense opposition. Um, so today, as I'm speaking, I am just praying that um, my words th would impart grace and strength to the moms here, grace and strength and vision to those of you who are looking ahead and maybe will be moms, grace and strength to the, those around us to encourage us, um, but also um, the strength to recognize the enemy, the tactics of the enemy, and renew your vision in the face of that. Get ready to, um, to fight the good fight and um, stand firm in what God's called us to. Nehemiah, it says in verse 3, I am doing a great work. Let's look at Nehemiah chapter 1 here. I'm going to go ahead and read the whole chapter. I'm reading in NAS this morning, NASB. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month Chislev, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, that Han and I, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. They said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against you. I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote part of the heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name and make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now, I was the cupbearer to the king. So there's, there's a little bit of our context. Nehemiah is living in Persia. He's a cupbearer to the king of the most important empire on planet Earth at that time. No small position. He, uh, I think uh, like 150 years earlier, the, um, Jerusalem was sacked by Babylon. And then in due time, Babylon was absorbed by Persia, as most of the known world was. Um, and so now, here is Nehemiah. He was born in Persia working in the palace, like this is his life, he's accustomed to this, and yet his heart is with, with Jerusalem. And the, the, just the sense that that is what his, where his calling was, his heart lies. When he hears a report from fellow Jews who are visiting that 
the wall is a shambles, that people are living in reproach, he doesn't just hear it as like, wow, that's a bummer. But he hears this and receives it as a burden from God. And I just want to say, Nehemiah was gripped by a godly burden in a very personal way. And as mothers, we need to be gripped by a very godly, God-sized burden of what he has called us to. Motherhood is not just a social construct. Okay, that's as, as the, the, new, the new lingo on the scene. Um, it is not a social construct that eventually we will be enlightened and evolve beyond. It is imagined by, created by, designed by the very God of heaven. He imagined mothers. He calls mothers. You know, I was thinking about this. I, you know, Mother's Day, moms, you could say <laughs> moms are pretty normal. There's not, it's not like the president rolling into town with a, you know, black tinted window SUVs when moms show up, we're everywhere. Moms are just exist, we're here. And at the same time, it is such, oh, it is such an amazing design by God. You know, I was thinking God loves people. If you can just imagine with me for a minute, some of the people that you know that God loves people. You know, I read about, like, we get Voice of the Martyr magazine. I'm reading this. I'm like, oh, God loves these people. And I, I, I meet new people, and I'm like, at the playground, and my heart is like, wow, God loves that woman. And he's, I just met her, but God knows her. And God loves people. How is it that God brings people into the earth, that God even causes them to exist, that he could know and love them, that he could cause those gifts and callings and plans and purposes which he knew before the foundations of the earth. He ha that's, like God, that's the way God sees people. How is it that he brings those people even to be? It's like through mothers. How amazing that is. How amazing that God would like have plans and purposes for someone's life and cause just a woman, to bear that life, to labor in great pain and even peril to bring that life to be, and then to be like emotionally, chemically, hormonally, in every way entangled with this person's life to see them thrive and, and trained and grow and become a functioning adult and never mind like serving the purposes of God and to like use a woman in such a unique way. Motherhood is not just like a thing. It's a divine calling from God. It is not an accident. It is not just biological. It is not just natural. It is a calling from God. We need to know that deep in our hearts. A lot of people knew that the wall of Jerusalem was a shambles. Nehemiah heard that and was gripped. Lots of people have babies. We need to be gripped. We know the God of the universe whose idea it was in the first place, and we can live lives that are gripped with his burden. Nehemiah saw what God saw and was gripped by God's heart. I want to encourage you this morning to be refreshed, to see what God sees in your home, in your children, and be gripped by the burden that God bears to see these destinies come to pass. We are building something of eternal worth, and God has called us to co-labor with him. It is, it is a great work. It is a great work. It cannot be understated. It cannot be overstated. It, none of it. It's a great work. Nehemiah, it says at the beginning of chapter 1, now, I was the cupbearer to the king. I love that line. Now, I think that it's probably in there mostly to indicate I happen to know a guy, right? But I read that, and I thought, after reading this book over several times, Nehemiah is a cup bearer, and he has a burden to build a city wall. The man has had a manicure, like, every morning of his life as he presents a glass. Like, this is the work he's accustomed to. You know, like, 
He looks nice, he smells good, and he offers wine. And he has a burden to build a wall. The calling of motherhood, you need to know that if you are a woman, God has called you to be a mother. Whether you have biological children or not, God has called you to be a nurturer and someone who brings forth life, who cultivates it, who disciplines it, who trains it, who invests her blood, sweat, and tears into it. It has nothing to do with natural talent or inclination or personality. It has everything to do with a willingness to see what God sees and bear his burden and recognize that God is the designer and he designed me to be a mother. You know, it makes me think of Isaiah 6, um, when, when Isaiah the prophet has that heavenly vision of the trains filling the temple and seraphim and cherubim, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and the voice of God thunders out, who will go for me and who shall I send? And Isaiah, like, doesn't even belong in that place. Like, like, you, like he's a man of filthy lips, right? He has to get... And yet his heart burns. He says, here am I, send me. Like, you don't need to feel like you're the mother of the year, like you know it all, like you've got the right personality, the right upbringing, the right talent, the right inclination. You need to say, here am I, Lord, send me. I will bear your burden. I will see what you see. I will use myself as an illustration. <laughs> I um, have seven children, and every morning I wake up and I just do what has to be done, right? Lord, give me your burden. Help me to see what you see. I did not plan my life to have seven children by the age of 41. It's not like this was what I like, set out to do. I just wanted to serve the Lord each day of my life. And along the way, seven children were born, <laughs> okay? And I feel all thumbs sometimes. I could never teach Jackie Ramsey's kindergarten class. I um, get, as a teenager, babysitting was like cold sweats. I would do it because you needed me and I don't know what to do. The baby is crying. I, I don't know. I'm just like not a, like a baby person. I don't really know. I want to help, but I'm not that person. It doesn't matter. You know, I can look at so many of you and think, wow, she's really good at that. Wow, she just knows how to, what to do with toddlers. Wow, that's amazing. I'm, I feel like I have to work so hard at all of those things. You know what? God has called me. And James chapter 1 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask me. So I spend a lot of time asking the Lord, how can I be a good mom? Because some things don't feel like they come naturally to me. But you know what? I'm going to serve the purpose of God in my generation. And I'm going to see these children raised up. And I'm their mom. Guys, it still feels, feels weird when I say I'm a mom. I'm like, I'm a mom? Like, my son is 15 and a half. You think I'd be used to that. I'm a mom? Yeah, I'm a mom. You just sow into those kids. It has nothing to do with whether or not you got early childhood development as your major in college. You are called to be a mother. It is a great work. The Hebrew word there says gadol. It means large in magnitude and extent, in intensity, in number, <laughs> for some of us, <laughs> in number, in importance. As I was like just thinking about that, I thought, how ironic is it that the devil can, in one minute, tell you, this is way more than you're up for. And the very next second tell you you're wasting your life doing nothing. And we believe both of those things. Isn't that amazing? The devil is so good at his job. And I want us this morning to, like, once again, lean into what God has called us to. You know, Jesus, when some of the last words he said on earth were, go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them to observe all that he has commanded you. You have a mission field. It is not out there. It is right here. That baby that toddler, that middle schooler, that young adult who is off still on their own, choosing their own way at this point, that is your mission field. You, this is your mandate as a mom, to make disciples, to teach them to observe all that he has commanded. And no one else can work that mission field the way that you can. 
no one else. You have such a unique role. Like as my mom was saying, what, for good or for bad, your worldview is your children's worldview. You're passing a legacy on. Um, a few years ago, I was doing a little bit of Bible study about motherhood. We all know that in Genesis chapter 1, as God is um, creating the world, he gets done with each day, creates the light, creates the dry land, the waters split, the lights in the sky, the fish. The and at the end of each thing, he looks at it and he saw that it was very good. Well, I'm reading along in my study, and I get to Ex Exodus chapter 2, I think it is, where we encounter the story of Moses. And, you know, Pharaoh was trying to destroy all the boy children. And Moses' mother has this baby. And the Bible, I mean, there's just a couple verses there to tell the story here. But it says that, and she looked at him and saw that he was beautiful. That is the same Hebrew word that in Genesis chapter 1 is translated good. And she saw in her baby the same thing that God saw. And I don't think, listen, your kids are beautiful, they're awesome, I love them. But you see something in your baby that I don't see. I see something in my baby that would cause me to lay my life down for them. I see that they are very good. That is a God vision. And it is not a vision that every woman who has a baby has. You know, a lot, of, a lot of women love their kids, but don't love motherhood. And I want to challenge you this morning to let God enlarge you, that you wouldn't just, oh, I love my kids, but, you know, can't stand them. Or I love my kids, but I don't really, like, I'm not really a good mom. No, God wants to equip you to see what he sees, to feel what he feels, and to stand in the gap. We are called to build in the context of continual warfare. As we'll see in Nehemiah. Ben, when are we supposed to end? I forgot to ask you that one question. Okay. In the, in the context of continual warfare, Alan Redpath, I read this great quote about Nehemiah. There is no winning without warfare. There is no opportunity without opposition. There is no victory without vigilance. For whenever the people of God say, let us arise and build, Satan says, let us arise and oppose. All right, ladies. So I'm not sure what your mental image is of a godly woman and mother, but it needs to include a really big sword and some really strong arms to wield that sword. This is yours. This is your territory, and there is a devil on the loose. So Nehemiah, Benny, can you put up 6 verse 3 one more time for me? Nehemiah says, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. I love that. I cannot come down. If motherhood and nurturing and raising children is a God-breathed calling, then you better believe it is surrounded by opposition. The enemy wants you off the job. I want to look a little bit at Nehemiah's story for some, just some insight into the sort of things that we face as we endeavor to do a great work. You know, Nehemiah is sent off by the king, long story short, and he has full authority granted to him and is fully equipped. Like, deal as good as done, right? Um, the king of Persia is backing up his endeavor. He enters Jerusalem. Chapter 2, I'm going to read chapter 2, verses 17 through 20. Nehemiah has gotten to Jerusalem. Oops, I don't know what that was. Um, and he's talking to the, um, to the Jewish brethren who he's going to build with. He says, then I said to them, you see the bad situation we are in, that Jerusalem is desolate and its gates burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. Then they said, let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. 
But, do, do, do. when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they mocked us and despised us and said, what is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build, but you have no portion, right, or memorial in Jerusalem. So the first thing the enemy comes along and does in Nehemiah's life is they question his activity and his authority. Who do you think you are and what do you think you're doing? I don't know, maybe I'm the only one who's heard that in my ear as I'm raising my children. Who do you think you are and what do you think you're doing? You know, Gary, a couple weeks ago, was Gary here? Said, he was talking about the advocate and the accuser, and he said, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. He accuses. It's what he does. Okay? We get surprised by that, but it's what he does. And here we are, encountering the accuser. Nehemiah could have heard that, and it could have instantly paralyzed him as he realized I am just a cupbearer, and I actually have no idea how to build walls. They're right. Who do I think I am, and what do I think I'm doing? And instead, Nehemiah declares prophetically the will of God, and he rebukes the enemy. He says, God will give us success. And in that strength of conviction, he says, we will arise and build. And he also says... You have no place here. How do you know you're not a fraud? <laughs> Maybe you've often felt like one. We will refer back to point one, <laughs> that there are no accidents, that you are a woman and you had a baby. You are a mother. God has called you. There are no accidents in the kingdom of God. And you can declare to the mocking voice of the accuser, he will give me success and I will arise and build. I will get out of bed this morning. I will smile and I will make breakfast. And I'm going to do it knowing that my God will give me success. My God. This was not my idea. People think it's their idea, you know. Like everything is, oh, I know we're all inundated right now with anti-motherhood rhetoric because of the um, Supreme Court stuff going on, but babies are, are made by God. There is not a person on the planet that does not bear the image of God. They are not an accident. Your babies are not an accident, and you're not an accident. God is ready to back you up. You step into your calling. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Now it came about when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry and mocked the Jews. He spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burned ones? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was near him, and he said, Even what they are building, if a fox should jump on it, he would break their stone ball down. Guys, I read this, and it makes my heart hurt, because I have heard these things, and I have been oppressed by them. I know what it feels like to hear, even what you are doing, a fox could knock it down. You feeble Jew. You are trying. You feel like a fake because you are a fake. You feel like you don't know what you're doing because you don't. That is the devil. That is the devil. Nehemiah says, verse 4, Hear, O our God, how we are despised. Return their reproach on their own heads and give them up for plunder in a land of captivity. Do not forgive their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out before you, for they have demoralized the builders. So we built the wall, and the whole wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. They cried out to the Lord, and they continued with a mind to work. Footnote, with a heart. 
their hearts were gripped, their minds were set. Deep within was a conviction from the Lord. Even if I don't know exactly how to build a wall, I am showing up for it. I'm going to do this. Have you ever done something knowing full well it's a wall that a fox could not knock over? Or have you ever not done something you know you were supposed to because you were afraid it would be a wall a fox could knock over? Um, one of my favorite quotes is by G.K. Chesterton. He says, anything worth doing is worth doing badly. Let your pride and your perfectionism fall to the side. If God has asked you to do it, you do your best. It might not be the best bread. It might not be the best homeschool year. It might not be the best devotions with your kids. It might not be the best whatever it is that the devil's taunting you about. You get in there and you do it. God will give us success. Obedience is what the Lord is calling us to. Nehemiah obeyed. The people with him had a mind to work, a mind to obey. You get in there and you do it because it is God's plan and he will not be mocked and he will not fail you. You serve the Lord in your day. Recognize the attacks of the enemy on your mind and your heart. Those feelings of defeat, despair, hopelessness, and apathy, that is actually not the Holy Spirit okay? Sometimes it sounds so true, it, like it must be the Lord. No, no, those are not things from the Lord. That is the devil. Isaiah 40 that says that he will give strength to the weary. That is the promise of the Lord, that he will give strength to the weary. You lean into that, into the Lord. And even if it seems like a funny little wall, you do it. Chapter 4, 7 through 23. Okay, so moving on here. I'm going to read a little chunk. Okay, so the foxes thing happened. Now, when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the repair of the walls of Jerusalem went on and that the breaches began to be closed, they were very angry. All of them conspired together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause a disturbance in it. But we prayed to our God, and because of them, we set up a guard against them day and night. Thus in Judah it was said, the strength of the burden bearers is failing, yet there is much rubbish, and we ourselves are unable to rebuild the wall. Our enemies said, they will not know or see until we come among them. Kill them and put a stop to the work. When the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times, they will come up against us from every place where you may turn. Then I stationed men in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, the exposed places, and I stationed the people and families with their swords, spears, and bows. When I saw their fear, I rose and spoke to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, then all of us returned to the wall, each one to his work. From that day on, half of my servants carried on the work, while half of them held the spears, the shields, the bows, and the breastplates. And the captains were behind the whole house of Judah. Those who were rebuilding the wall and those who carried burdens took their load with one hand, doing the work, and the other holding a weapon. As for the builders, each wore his sword girded at his side as he built, while the trumpeter stood near me. I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we are separated on a wall far from one another. At whatever place you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we carried on the work with half of them holding spears from dawn until the stars appeared. At that time, I also said to the people, let each man with his servants spend the night within Jerusalem so that they may be a guard for us by night and a laborer by day. So neither I, my brothers, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us removed our clothes. Each took his weapon, even to the water. So they question Nehemiah's authority. They mock and taunt his ability. And Nehemiah continues on. So now it's all-out war, planning attacks. All right. The seeds of doubt haven't worked. The taunts and the mockery hasn't worked. So it's an onslaught of demonic attack. 
You, your marriage, your home, your children, they are targets of the enemy. So what does Nehemiah do? In verse 13, I love this, it says, I stationed men in the lowest parts of the space, the exposed places. Number one, what are the low places in your wall? You know you. You know where the enemy shows up all the time. You know what those are. Defend those spots. You arm yourself. We don't have to just let the enemy walk and climb over the wall. We can defend those spots. Know the word. Know the word. Know the word. Um, get, get friends who are praying with you, who are speaking truth to you. Confess these things to your husband, to people who will pray over you and help you. Um, comparison, depression, anger, laziness. Don't just hope that like somehow it gets better. Grab a sword. Let's see some victory. Delete Instagram. Get counseling on child training. Cancel Netflix. Throw away the chocolate chip stash in the pantry. <laughs> Whatever you got to do. Let's not be fools. Let's recognize, oh, these are low spots, and the devil likes low spots. Let's get in there. Ask for, be transparent with one another. Guys, the devil is real. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your marriage, your home, your family. We need to be transparent with one another. I have a low spot. That's okay. So do I. We can help one another. We can stand in the gap with one another. Number two, in verse 14, Nehemiah says to them, remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Motherhood requires that we live in a constant state of remembering who God is and worship. Who is your God? At 11 a.m. on Wednesday, when the whole week is already a complete dumpster fire, who is God? Who is God? He has not, not left you, he has not forsaken you, and he's ready to show up. In mountaintops and valleys, when everything's going well, when it's a disaster, whatever it might be, remember the Lord who is great and awesome. When years of building seem to be resulting in nothing, who is your God? Remember the Lord who is great and and awesome. Number three, in verses 21 through, 21 through 23, I love this picture of, so they were all had a sword here and a hammer here and they never took it off even to get the water. Always ready for battle. Always ready. Arm yourself with the word. Pray in the spirit. See yourself as a warrior. We get surprised and this is what's, maybe it's just me. I get attacked by the enemy, and I'm like, I'm a failure. I'm, I'm e experiencing attack. I'm a failure. No. No. The enemy attacks. It doesn't mean I'm a success or a failure. It is the way. It's the game. It's the rules of play that I live for the kingdom of light in a world governed by, as yet, the prince of darkness, and he is out for blood. And I need to know that. I don't need to be surprised by it. I don't need to be undone by it. I can be prepared for it. I have a little domain and I'm establishing a kingdom outpost and when I wake up every morning, I can know I am called by God. I am equipped for every good work by the word of God. God will give me success as I build my home and I will not be dismayed by a hard day, a hard moment, sin in my kids that I have to train and discipline Guys, that's the, whole, that's the job. And yet I'm like, oh my word, we're a failure. There's sin in our house. Yes, yes, there is. There is. It's in you, it's in your husband, and oh my, definitely it's in all those little kids who need Jesus in a really bad way. There, don't be surprised. Arm yourself. You are called to be nurturing, warm, make chocolate chip cookies, wear an apron if you want to, but please, Wear a sword and strengthen your arm for battle because that is what we're called to. Um, the, last, the last little attack that I wanted to look at was in chapter 6, 1 through 2. Now, when it was reported to Sanballat, Tobiah, to Geshem the Arab, and to the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall, 
I had succeeded and that no breach remained in it, although at that time I had not set up the doors and the gates. Then Sanballat and Geshem sent a message to me saying, come, let us meet together at Chepharim in the plain of Ono. But they were planning to harm me. And this is where we read the response. I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? The doubt hasn't worked, the mockery hasn't worked, the all-out attacks haven't worked, so we'll try seduction. We'll just woo him away for just a quick meeting. Come, just, just leave your post for a second. We just want to chat. The enemy will appeal. He'll put on sheep's clothes, and he'll show up in your Instagram feed, and he'll show up in, in whatever it is that's infiltrating the way that you think, and he'll show up with maybe, probably not devil horns, okay? Probably something more like, you deserve a break. God just wants you to be happy, okay? You need, you need self-care. Now, does the Lord give us breaks? Yes, he leads us by green pastures and still waters. Praise the Lord. He restores my soul. I don't have to go finding that. I just lean into my shepherd. Okay, does the Lord give me happiness? Yes, yes, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. Amazing how when I look for happiness, I end up leaving my husband and kids. And that's my, my pursuit of happiness. When I pursue Jesus, I get fullness of joy. Self-care, I Take a nap if you need, you know, what, who was it who said sometimes the best spiritual war, war, warfare is taking a nap? Okay. I don't often manage the steak, and the naps are a joke, but it's amazing. You can fall asleep with a kid doing this for five minutes, and it's still restorative. <laughs> but don't give in. If the enemy can't get you all those other ways, he will just draw you. Just draw you. Come away from your post. Come away from your post. Don't leave your post. Don't leave your post. The last thing he says in that verse, in, in 6, verse 3, why should the work stop? Why should the work stop while I leave it? The work cannot stop. And it is your work. It is your work. Um, Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9 is like a little microcosm of that great work that we're doing. And tell me if this sounds like it stops. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. It is a great work and it cannot stop. There are doubts that come to your heart. There's mockery. There's taunting. There are attacks. There's seduction. And then there's just plain old tired. Just tired. You know, the enemies of Nehemiah probably were watching to see when this cupbearer would get weary of stone cutting. <laughs> Right? Like, pretty sure he's not going to last long. Your supply needs to be from God. It needs to be from God. Trying to do this on your own strength just results in, like, staring at that clock every single night and checking out. Or staring at the timeline. Grad high school graduation and I'm out of here, baby. Whatever it might be. You need your supply to be from God, and it can be. One of my favorite verses is in Psalm 71. His strength can make you a marvel to many. It says, my life is an example to many because you have been my strength and protection. The NASB says, you make my life a marvel. How does she do that? God. <laughs> God. He can make your life a marvel to you. That's why I'm always like, Lord, blow my mind here because I'm exhausted. Show up and just absolutely blow my mind. I'm ready. You need Jesus. I want to um, close with just some 
life verses for me that have put supernatural strength in my soul and that have brought me success in the day of battle. I want to share them with you. I want to encourage you to have some verses, to ask the Lord to give you some things that you can hang all of your hopes on, all of your exhaustion on, all of your utter desperation on. Galatians 6, 7 through 9, we know this one. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. God working in you and through you will not be mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal light, life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. See that? He has the last word. He will not be mocked. But who will you believe? Because there is a mocking spirit whispering in your ear. Every morning you go to that little garden and there is not a sprout to be seen. You're looking for it as the siblings are squabbling and as you feel like my mothering skills have not improved or whatever it is that that mocking spirit is whispering at you. See, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing. The Bible says God will not be mocked. That his word, Isaiah 55, which comes forth from heaven will accomplish that for which it was sent. We need to hang our hat on that. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 10. I love this chunk. It's talking about m giving money, but man, I read it one morning at about, I will never forget. I had two babies. William was, I think it was like February. So he was a few months old and William Jameson was like two and a half. William had like his first fever, awful virus. And I was in California, so like may as well bend the moon. I had nobody to help me, and um, I'm up all night long. William wouldn't sleep unless I was like had him in my carrier pacing the bedroom for like two nights in a row, and then Ryan's off to work the next day, and you're like, bye. How do I do this? And I remember sitting at my kitchen table and reading 2 Corinthians while I was feeding Jameson breakfast and reading this and being like, wow, this is huge. This is God showing up. Now this I say. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. Lord, make me a cheerful giver as a mom. And God is able to make all, can I just pause there for a minute? The narrative in the world is that we give, we give, and we give, and we're like a martyr and a doormat, and ev we deserve a medal. Like, and I'm going to whine about it. <laughs> right? No, God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Tell that to your no nights of sleep. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. I am putting that one in the bank. I'm going to draw on it and I'm going to expect a supply for every good work that God has called me to, which includes this. I build and the God of heaven will give me success. I sow my very last seed of strength, hope, faith, energy, and I know that when I reach in for more, it's going to be there. I just keep reaching. I keep sowing. Um, Galatians 4.19, short little verse. Paul says, my children with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. I love that verse. That is what God has called us to. To labor and see these children born and then to labor again until I see Christ formed in you. That is a God. That is, Lord, I want to see what you see and I'm going to carry the burden of your heart. I'm not just going to go through the motions. I'm not just going to be a woman who had a baby. I'm going to be a mother. 
I'm going to embrace your calling. And I, I read that verse, and I have to just honor my own mother for putting flesh on that verse for me, for seeing her continue to labor. I don't know. I'm 41, and she's 25 years older than me. So for that long, laboring until she sees Christ formed in all nine of us children. Nehemiah said, I am doing a great work, and I want you to know that you, you are doing a great work. It is a great work worth all of your life, and it is a great work that is beyond you that God will supply. Give yourself to Jesus. Walk with him. Look unto him, the author and finisher of our faith. We need to do this with Jesus knowing the fellowship of his presence as you set yourself to a task in the yoke with him. He has called us as moms in a unique way to co-labor with him, that those Ephesians 2, those good works which he prepared beforehand, that he would see those getting walked out in your children. That is the call of God, that we have the privilege to say, yes, God, I feel like a cupbearer building a stone wall, but yes, I will do what you've called me to do. Amen. Thanks, Bill. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. And I want to I want to close here today by by inviting if you would. I'd like to invite the mothers forward right now. So if you're a mom, just come on forward. We want to pray for you today as we're going to close today. William's going to come up and play the guitar and lead us in some worship. And man, I, you know, you just think it's like, how can the Lord speak? It's amazing how the Lord can speak to, to each of us in different ways. Even though even this message was for moms, it ministered to me. You know, it ministered to me as a dad and what I'm called to do or the, where I'm walking in life. Come on, let's fill this front here, ladies. Come on, let's fill the front right here in front and step up closer because I'm going to invite the body to come gather behind you. But as Danica was sharing, actually, let's do that now. Let's invite the husbands, fathers, children that are here. Let's gather around these wonderful ladies. You know, the, the word that was on my heart, Danica, as you were sharing, it's hard not to go to Proverbs 31. But the word there in Proverbs 31, it says this. It says, she dresses herself with strength. She dresses herself with strength. That's what we're doing here right now. We're dressing ourselves with strength. We're, 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 you know, it's like we're putting on the armor. Like, and we're, we're praying with each other. We're standing with each other. I don't know where you need strength today, but he knows exactly where you need strength. Strength in your mind, strength in your heart, strength in your feet, strength in the sword. You know, there's so many things that, that Danica mentions. It's just like, Lord, I'm called to that great work. And uh, I got some blisters on my hands. My knees are hurting. But there's some burnt stones that he's putting in the wall. And Lord, we thank you. We give you glory. We give you praise. Brothers just and, and sisters that are just gathered there around these mothers today, we, we, can you just pray prayers of strength where you are and just begin to pray for some impartation of the strength of the Lord to the work of God here.
Teach me how to lead those around me. Lord, I do the light for you. And it is firm. It's a strong foundation. You are good. I'm so
Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you today, Lord, that you clothe us with strength, and it's your strength, Lord. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we pray more of the same. Lord, bless everyone as they go today. May they know the peace and joy of the Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.